Welcome in. It is Big Ten today. We are presented by Gatorade on this Monday. Dave Revson, Andy Katz with you. It was a loaded weekend of hoops. It was a great time, hypothetically, to be homesick on the couch. Just, just hypothetically. If someone was, yes. And it was a great time to watch all this basketball, both men's and women's. Yes, and now you get to share all yes. of that knowledge you accumulated. And I'm here. With us. You're here. I know. I know. Playing hurt. We, we admire it greatly. On the other side of it. Let's get to our... Big story. It is all the results from the weekend. Purdue going up to Toronto, rallying in the second half to top Alabama. Speaking of rallies, how about Penn State coming back from 18 down to top Ohio State? Michigan went on the road and beat Iowa. Nebraska beating Michigan State for the first time in seven years. And Rutgers a winner over in-state rival Seton Hall. Elsewhere, Northwestern showing no mercy on Detroit mercy. Minnesota big second half win over Florida Gulf Coast, some tough results in high-profile non-conference games Saturday. Illinois fell at Tennessee. Wisconsin lost at number one Arizona. And Auburn really took it to the Hoosiers. So let's dive into a few of these games. And Purdue, to me, was the, the headliner, the Zach Eady homecoming game in Toronto. And, man, that first half, Alabama could not miss. You hit 13 three-pointers in a half as Alabama did and still not able to win the game. It really speaks to the resilience of Purdue A, and it speaks to how good Edie is as well. You know, on Friday, uh, before I got sick, uh, we were talking about Mark Sears yes. from Alabama. He has elevated his game. He played phenomenal in that first half for Alabama. I think a year ago, we saw this against Jameer Young, Boo Booey. Those are the kind of games that Purdue lost. They get in the hole, commit turnovers, you know, the team gets hot, makes threes, and they can't get it back. Right. That's what's different with this group. Zach Eady was phenomenal. 35 points, gets to the free throw line, 11 of 11. Uh, he was my national player of the week because he's just unstoppable. He's the reigning national player of the year. But Braden Smith. International player of the week. Yes. Right? Went to Canada. Uh, and, yeah. and, you know, that doesn't always work out when you get the homecoming and right. you win no, like I that. I know. And Braden Smith, 27 points. He is playing at an all Big Ten level, taking his game to another level, and he is meeting the moment with each one of these players. And that is a big difference, as well as obviously Fletcher Lawyer playing well, Lance Jones, Miles Colvin, and then the supporting cast. They're all playing their roles, whether it's Mason Gillis, Ethan Morton, um, you know, Caleb First inside, Trey Kaufman Wren. Everyone has a defined role. They've accepted it. This is another big time win for Purdue. They've got probably the most Big Ten wins of any team in the country, regardless of conference, setting up next Saturday, which I know we'll talk about later in the show, matchup against number one Arizona. Yeah, going to be huge, that game in Indy. But you talk about Braden Smith and how much he has elevated his game. You combine Edie's points and Braden Smith's points, 62 points. That is the most for a Purdue duo since Glenn Robinson and Conzo Martin had 73 in the 1994 NCAA tournament against Kansas. So those are two huge names, obviously, in Purdue history. But it gives you a sense of how devastating that combination was for the Boilers. And as you said, huge one Saturday in Indy against Arizona. Get to that in a bit. How about Penn State? I mean, they had a great chance to win on the road at Maryland on Wednesday night, a game you saw here on the Big Ten Network. Let it slip away, and you have to think, kind of kicking themselves. Now five straight losses they're heading home, taking on Ohio State. They dig a massive hole in that game and dig their way out of it, overcome an 18-point deficit to win the game. I think this speaks volumes about Mike Rhodes and the fact that he really has a hold on this team because this is an easy one to fold the tent in. Yeah, I mean, first of all, they could easily be 2-0 in the Big Ten, as you yes. said. Um, disappointing performance down in Orlando in that tournament, then that home Bucknell loss. That looked like things could have really steamrolled. Statistically, in the first eight games, they shot 29% on threes. The last three, 36%. Not dramatically better, but it's, it's certainly going in the right direction. Their backcourt group of Ace Baldwin, you've got uh, Kanye Cleary, Dunn. I mean, all those guys put together. It's one of the better backcourts in the Big Ten. Uh, now, can they build off of this? They're going to win games, certainly at home, possibly on the road. Um, they have the look of a postseason team. What postseason tournament that becomes, we shall see. The biggest difference with this Penn State team, though, is unlike a year ago where they needed to make threes, this group doesn't have to because they can really get into the lane with these drivers they have, especially Ace Baldwin. Doesn't hurt, though, when Leo Boyle goes 4-5 or 5 from yes, behind the arc. Yes, you know, can yes. he be the next Andrew Funk? I, I think we're all 
you know, kind of trying to, to equate this team to the team we saw a year ago. But you're right. It's a very different type of team. It's it, they're, What they do defensively is obviously radically different right. from what they did a season ago. And, again, if you play like that, you're going to win a lot of games, to your point. What do you make of Ohio State? Were you surprised that it kind of fell apart the way that it did for them, given the fact that I think at some points early on this year they have looked like an upper echelon team in this league? Not an excuse. Third game in seven days. I felt they t- got tired. Um, they did still have 21 assists for 27 field goals. I still like this Ohio State team. I think Chris Holtman and crew can check this. They have a week before they go to Atlanta to play UCLA, right. uh, a UCLA team that's really struggling, just lost to Villanova on the road that doesn't have a marquee win. But that would be another signature win for them, even though we don't know where UCLA is going to end up. Um, I still think this UCLA team, excuse me, Ohio State team, is going to be somewhere in that top four or five in the Big Ten. Disappointing loss the way it happened, I think, a year ago. Same thing. We talk about different degree of Purdue. That's the kind of loss. Remember, they lost, what? Yeah, it's like 13 in a row. 13 in a row. Yeah. Yeah. This thing steamrolled. Um, I don't think that will happen with this group. Yeah, it was, it was crazy how it steamrolled last year from a team that we thought was right. – toward the very top of the league to, to what ended up happening there in the middle of the season. I, I, I do think, like, you look at that game, and Penn State just hit tough shots, right? I mean, like, high degree of difficulty, contested threes, and sometimes that just happens. Sometimes a, a team just gets hot, and then the, it starts to steamroll a little bit there at home. I was in Iowa City for Michigan and Iowa. I was really impressed with Michigan in the second half, just incredibly balanced. ended up with six players in double figures, Terrace Reed, who had scored double figures once in his career, in one 11-point game, he scored 19. He was fabulous. I just thought the hustle plays, like all the little stuff, Michigan really did well. And that's another one where you're like, you know, if they can play like that, if they can play like they did against St. John's in the Garden, or those two performances, you look at them and say, that's a clear postseason team, maybe an NCAA attorney team. It's some of the other stuff that's happened in between that makes you scratch your head. Yeah, I mean, first of all, they went out to Oregon in between all that, lost an overtime game. They were right there. If I'm trying to remember their first game in Atlantis. It might have been Memphis. Uh, I'm yes, trying to remember. Memphis. That was a close game. And then things kind of steamrolled. Tons of close losses. Yeah, I mean, that's down, been the down in Atlantis. Yep. So they haven't, If you know, remember the last couple of years, there were some blowout losses in the non-conference. Blowout losses, especially in the second half, for a lot of these same Michigan players. Um, that's not happening. This group is really close. Uh, and talking to Phil Martelli this morning, you know, they feel really positive about where they are right now. And if Doug McDaniel can continue to progress and play like he did and has played, he can help elevate this team to a next level. They've got their Jumpman Classic game coming up against Florida down in Charlotte. Um, Eastern Michigan before that. So they've got a couple opportunities to just continue to get better before the Big Ten play. And I, I agree with you. I think they're going to be one of those teams in that middle that has a chance to elevate up uh, to compete for one of those, you know, Thursday uh, or, or Friday games. We'll see. What really struck me sitting courtside for that one was Doug McDaniel, Olivia Kamwa, zero points each in the first half. Those are two biggest scores. They both had goose eggs. In the first half, and yet they're up by two at the half. And then the second half, those guys come alive and, and really pulled away. It does make you wonder a little bit about the Hawkeyes. Frankly, the, the final score is not indicative of this game. I mean, Michigan was up by 20 points in the final four minutes before Iowa threw in some meaningless threes. But when the game was on the line, I think they were one of their first 14 or 15 from three-point range. They just could not, you know, could throw it in the ocean from the beach. And then the interior defense continues to be a huge issue, Andy. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I watched Fran McCaffrey's postgame news conference, and he was incredibly calm and optimistic. Um, they've had three blowout losses in a row. Um, take one in each context. The one at Purdue, no one was beating Purdue last Monday, uh, a week ago tonight, West Lafayette after the Boilermakers had lost to Northwestern in overtime. Then the rivalry game in Ames. Again, tough follow-up. This game is probably the biggest head-scratcher. He said after the game Sunday that they had quality shots. The way they started on the three-point line obviously was frustrating to them. But if you look at their personnel, they've got players who can make those shots. Absolutely. So Tony Perkins, Peyton Sanford, um, Patrick McCaffrey, you know, you're talking about Owen Freeman, Ben Cricky. Those guys, if they play up to their potential, 
they have a team that certainly can win games and be in the mix for the postseason. We'll have to wait and see. But um, all is not lost in Iowa, but this is a bad three-game stretch. No doubt. Um, they've got some easy games that, you know, you would think they can rectify. And they've been down in the Big Ten standings at this time of the year before. They're on three last year. Yeah, and you know what's crazy? We, we did this on the broadcast Monday. They're now, if I'm not mistaken, 2-10 and ten since 2017 in December Big Ten games. Right. Yet they've finished pretty well in the Big Ten. No doubt. Look, these teams always get better. And, and I spent a lot of time with them yesterday. I know he thinks this team can get better. He was very optimistic. I mean, they had lost – before yesterday, they had lost four games. And the, the four teams they had lost to had lost four games total themselves, including Oklahoma's undefeated. So – they lost to really good teams, and again, we just made the argument that Michigan could be a good team as well. It just, you just have to get better. 132 points in the paint over the last three games. They just have to get better defensively on the inside. You know, before we move on, I just yeah. want to add about Juwan Howard. I'm talking to Phil Martelli. Um, the plan is for him to return as the head coach sometime within the next two weeks, that he's following doctor's orders. Uh, and so th- that he's progressed. You saw him in person. Yeah, yeah no, he's and, and there so at the practice. He came over and, and said that's hello the plan. to Sean and so we'll to wait me. And see and, what happens. Yeah. yeah. No, absolutely. But again, Phil Martelli is clearly the head coach right yes, now. I mean, he's yes. the one who is running the practice, everything. Any media questions, you know, Juwan, we had a great conversation with Juwan, but in terms of asking about the team, that was deferred to, to Coach Martelli. So I think that that's part of his way of kind of delineating, compartmentalizing, hey, this is my role right now, and I'm, I'm following the protocol of what I'm supposed to do. And one other quick nugget, I just thought that in watching your broadcast on Sunday, it's really interesting. It? Yes, yeah. it was phenomenal. Yeah. And Sean is always ex- excellent as usual. It's interesting that both head coaches hired former head coaches as top assistants because you had that stretch where you had Phil Martelli yeah. and Sherman Dillard. Yeah. So trusted individuals that can take over when something happens, health, projection, whatever. Right, yes, and, and we had both represented yesterday. Uh, Nebraska, really good last few minutes or so, and they knock off Michigan State at home. Let's focus on Nebraska first. I, I realize Michigan State is a huge story They just haven't had the year that anyone expected them to. But, man, Nebraska is better. And this was a really good performance. And they let one slip away against Minnesota and give the Gophers a ton of credit. They played a brilliant second half in that game. But to come home against a team you've had virtually no success against in Michigan State, to be down going in those final four minutes and to pull it out, I think that speaks volumes about the Huskers. Yeah, I mean, Nebraska's played one bad game against Creighton. Yes. Uh, which is not a bad game. I mean, that's not bad to play that as a bad game right. because Creighton's really good. We'll compete at the top of the Big East. Um, and, and talking to Nebraska, a couple key po- points are 9 of 11 uh, from the field uh, at the beginning of the second half. So that was another new trend for them to play so well at the beginning of the second half. 16 turnovers against Minnesota, only 9 against Michigan State, and they shot 50% against Michigan State. Those are winning numbers. And if they can consistently do that, they've got a chance, as I thought weeks ago, to be a factor in some sort of Big Ten race, moving up, they're getting healthy, the personnel is there, for them to, to, I think, have a pretty good run in this league. I think this is a good team. Two guys that really stood out to me in this game, Juwan Gary was great, obviously, and Rink Mast. I mean, the rebounding, the passing, he doesn't, I mean, he can score down low, and and we've seen him do that, but... You know, it was, it was 14 rebounds and six assists from a guy who plays, you know, the 4-5 position for you. I mean, that's pretty good. And, and they get it to him at that elbow, and he's a really good decision maker. I was really impressed with his performance. Again, another transfer yep. who fills a void. Uh, and Fred Hoiberg's done this throughout the course of his career on a consistent basis, regardless of where he's been. Uh, and, you know, he's just never had a full complement of his roster at Nebraska. Now let's see what happens. I hate to circle games in late December, but their game against K-State coming up. That's like their last big opportunity before they get back into Big Ten play. Real important game for them if they can get that one. we got to talk about Michigan State. Uh, They're four and five now. I'm a preseason top five team. They are four and five. And it it just felt like this game was right there for the taking for them and and would have been – a really good win after they really got bludgeoned by Wisconsin. I mean, never led in that game. The Badgers completely dominated. So what do you make of what's happening here with Michigan State? And, and you know, I, Tom Izzo was as downcast as I've seen him, frankly, in, in the post. I mean, it, it just feels like he doesn't really have any obvious answers here. 
Yeah, look, I don't have the answer as to why Xavier Booker isn't playing. I don't get that. Um, they obviously need his presence, his talent. Literally didn't play at all. Zero. Not one minute. Yeah. DNP. Five-star player. Um, so that's perplexing. They're veteran guys. Well, they had moments. Obviously, Malik Hall scored well. He had 22. Tyson Walker had 17. Hogarth had 12. Uh, Jaden Akins, eh, you know, I mean, like, they've not played consistently every game out. And then sometimes the freshmen play well, and then they don't. Um, the post has been a big problem. They got basically nothing out of Cooper and Suzoko. Right. Um, Malik Hall gave him something at the <clears> four, and yeah. that helps a lot, as you mentioned. But they but also... Yeah, they can't, they can't dump it inside and get a basket. Right, which... Yep clogs everything up offensively. I thought the key moment late in that game where they had a, they were up one, if I'm not mistaken, late possession, they have to settle for a heave, if I'm not mistaken, I think it was from Walker, at the top of the key, like way out, right. great defensive play by Nebraska to almost expire the shot clock, and then next time down, Nebraska scores, takes the lead, game over. And <clears throat> that epitomized their struggles offensively in that situation. That's an enormous game coming up against Baylor. Massive. To try. I mean, you know, you're four and five. I mean, this ties for the worst start of the Izzo It's their era. last chance yep. to have a big time win. Right. I mean, they just have nothing on their resume Zero. right now. And, and it's just so uncanny. Games in Detroit. Michigan State. Yep. Uh, how about Rutgers? Got Mawat ba- Mag back. Yeah. They get a great win at Seton Hall and a rivalry game that means so much to both sides. First time they've won on the road in this rivalry in 10 years. They just hadn't played well against Wake Forest on the day that the big announcement know, know. came out uh, of Dylan Harper, the, the five-star, the number two player in the country. But this is the team that if they can play like this, Andy, they made perimeter shots, which they haven't necessarily done this year. And then I just think MAG gives them a huge influx of, of talent and versatility. It, it's, a, it's a major boost. In talking to Rutgers on Monday morning, um, they're looking at his energy, how it helps Cliff Amore. So he gets eight boards, so that takes a little pressure off Amore. Amore played great. And (coughs) Jamichael Davis, the freshman point. Derek Simpson's not playing well, but Davis is playing really well. (coughs) His first start, only two turnovers in four games. Uh, He was Ace Bailey's point guard. Ace Bailey coming next year. Yes, that works. So that's good, obviously with Dylan Harper as well. So they feel comfortable with Davis at the point. Uh, and if they can get more off that bench, you're right. This is a Rutgers team that we all expected to see at the beginning of the season. They've got another another big game to circle. Mississippi State on December 23rd. Um, Mississippi State, a team that has been up and down, did beat Northwestern. That would be a great win for Rutgers heading back into the Big Ten. You talk about the young players. Davis, really good. How about Gavin Griffiths? Had a yep. really nice game. So, I mean, you think about those Goggles. two guys as freshmen, yes, the, the begoggled one. Uh, you think about those two guys as freshmen. You think about adding in Bailey and Harper. And man, it is going to be an exciting yeah, year. Don't sleep on Rutgers. And Rutgers. No, I We've know. We've said You're, that before in the show. Yes, you have, you've said it, I, I think, roughly 40 times. First game for Northwestern since the win over Purdue. No problem with winless Detroit. Nick Martinelli sporting the headband to cover up some stitches after he got elbowed in practice, leading the way with a career-high 22. The catch shot 56%. From the field, this is a game you expect to win, obviously, but a nice performance nonetheless. Yes, and by the way, good nugget of information on why he was wearing the headband. Yeah, well, you know. Uh, uh, look, Ryan Langbord. reporter over here. I know. Langbord, Martinelli, Ty Berry, uh, Barnheiser all played really well. You know who didn't play great? Well, he didn't shoot great, boo-booey. But, but, but that's you, okay. Right, well, but I would also say, like, you know, what, what – Detroit tried to do was they trapped him every time he got across midcourt and tried to get the ball out of his hands. And the guy, then it's four on three, and he just dished it to his teammates who hit open threes. Which is great. Yes. I mean, I think this was actually a good confidence game for the rest of the perimeter and the wings. Because if they're going to advance in the Big Ten and finish in the top four or five, which they legitimately can and possibly should, they're going to need all these guys on different nights uh, to perform. Because we know the... The front court is limited. Uh, they somehow survived uh, down to the last foul against Zach Eady on their third big. So they need each one of these perimeter guys to perform, and Absolutely. they all did in yeah. a game like this. And they're going to have to do it against, I know, Chicago State and DePaul. DePaul. and Right. Arizona you know, State's a big one next Yeah, week. yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> That's the one you got to get. Uh, yeah, Bowie, last two games, 17 assists, one turnover. It's pretty good. 
A uh, similar story, Minnesota and Florida Gulf Coast. The Eagles just one win over a D1 team. So, again, this is one you expect to win, but you're without your best player in Dawson Garcia. Uh, Minnesota pulled away really nicely and kind of built on the win they got against Nebraska last week. Yeah, and according to Minnesota, it was not a high ankle sprain. So, Dawson Garcia probably won't play Tuesday, uh, but they don't think he's going to be out that long. So, that's key for the Gophers. They still have not put together a full 40 minutes. We've seen the potential in each individual player. I think, you know, Ola Joseph is a great example of that. Um, and I think, again, they've done a nice job recovering from a disastrous loss that they had against Missouri at home, a game they should have won that would have helped their confidence. But I think a year ago, that would have steamrolled even more for this kind of a gopher team. Uh, and so Ben Johnson's kept this young group together, and they're going to beat people. They're going to be people. No doubt. Uh, first of four straight home games for them before they resume conference play. Assuming they win these games, I don't want to make any assumptions. Never but, assume. But, but, but they are, these are all games they should win. They have a really good chance to head into January with more wins than they had all of last season. They, they beat right. at 10 wins and uh, almost certainly will pass that before the calendar flips to 2025. 2024. 24. Don't yes, ahead of I'm, I'm ahead of us. Uh, let's get uh, some of the rough out-of-conference performances. Uh, Illinois falling at Tennessee. I don't think there's any shame in that. The, the volunteers are, are really, really good. The thing that bothered me is it felt like Illinois fell back into that rut of settling for outside shots. And, and part of it's Tennessee. They're just like that is a hard team to, to get the ball inside yes. against. But this is where Illinois goes sideways to me. And, and again, they had a great week, but I, the outside shots bother me. It also felt like, we talked about this on Friday, like they were playing with house money. Uh, and, you know, because they won the first two of this road swing. Yeah. And so they're like, ah, you know, whatever. We won two. If right. we go two and one, it's okay. Uh, it almost is like they believe that because it just didn't feel like they were as intense as they were at Rutgers on the previous weekend or when I saw them Tuesday in New York. The question for me is Marcus Domask because you're not expecting 33 like we saw against FAU. But if you only get six, it's got to be somewhere in between right. to take some of that pressure off of Terrence Shannon. Uh, it just feels like he's got to come somewhere in the middle on a consistent basis. I still feel like this is a really good team. I know you do yes. as well. I think what's great about this team is they do have a lot of different guys who can beat you. So, right, we saw Damask step up in that game against FAU. And, you know, I think Terrence Shannon is going to be the, the given here. But, you know, Coleman Hawkins is a really good player. Quincy Guerriere is a really good player. Like, these guys all have Can you get more potential. out of Dane Danger? Yeah. I mean, to me, Dane Danger, he cleans up the mess, right? He's a good low post player. But I think your, your point on Danger, if your point on Danger is – can you, can you hit him on the block and can you, can you get an easy two? When you're struggling from threes. Yeah, yeah. I, I, do th I mean, I just, again, like, I think they had a great week. Yes. They didn't have a good week. They had a great week. Like, you go to Rutgers and you win. We both think Rutgers is good. FAU, a Final Four team from a year ago in the Garden. I, th those are great wins. But for them to be like, can they take that next step this year? Can they be a second weekend team? Can they make a deeper run? To me, yeah, that, that, that's a huge part of it. Wisconsin had a good week, too. They topped Marquette at Michigan State. Then they went on the road against the nation's number one team, and, and it did not go well, to say the least. Yeah, I mean, look, this was like, you, you know what this felt like to me? The times when Wisconsin would play against, like, Oregon in the NCAA tournament yeah. or a team like that, that just, it was a bad matchup. This is a bad matchup for Wisconsin. They're deep inside. Uh, their guards are stronger, experienced. Right. Um and McHale, for those that haven't seen it, it's one of the best home courts in the country. And it was rocking. First time they were number one in the country. They're playing that game uh, as number one. Uh, it's kind of like Iowa at Purdue. Like, this was almost like a no-win situation right. for Wisconsin to go in. I credit Greg Gard for scheduling it, uh, but it was really tough. I think they pause back. I don't think that we'll see them take a step back after this loss. No, I would agree. I, yeah. I just think it's a difficult circumstance. They weren't able to slow the game down, which is obviously And it's what different they than do. the Providence game. Providence looked like it was like almost like a lack of effort. You know what right. I mean? 
This didn't feel that way. Arizona's just really good. Man, John Blackwell's good. Yes. Rush Regard is, yes. is really good. And that's positive. Really, that is a positive. Uh, Indiana overwhelmed by Auburn. They gave up 104 points. They actually got off to a good start. They led by 12 early, and it kind of felt like, okay. Right. And then it just steamrolled on them. Yeah, I mean, again, Auburn's quickness really bothered them. Um, you know, this is a huge week for Indiana. We talked about this on Friday. They had two games, this one against Auburn and Atlanta, and now home against Kansas. Uh, this feels like a year ago when North Carolina came to Indiana. You know, same time, early, well, a little earlier in, in November in the ACC Big Ten Challenge, but um, can be a signature win for this team to sort of reset because they still don't have that. Now, they played UConn in the Garden. They played, uh, at, you know, Auburn in Atlanta. Now they've got one of these blue bloods, these top five teams on their home court. Yeah. It's a golden opportunity to play their best game of the season. It's funny. Do they have it in them. I, I'm talking on both sides of my mouth. I, man, I wish they shot more threes. I, right? I mean, they're the inverse of Illinois. I, it's just hard to win this way. There, there's only one team in the nation that gets a lower percentage of its points from the three-point line than Indiana does. Like, it's hard to win that way in, in this day and age of college basketball. We'll see. Time to go around the Big Ten, starting with the NCAA Volleyball Tournament, where top overall seed Nebraska advanced to the Final Four with a 3-1 win over third-seeded Arkansas. Lexi Rodriguez moving the Huskers along on the bracket as they now head to Tampa, 17th Final Four all-time, second most of any team in the nation. They are the subject of our big stat, brought to you by Gatorade. Huskers now have 32 wins on the season. It ties for the most they've had in a single year since 2007. The other two times the Huskers reached the 32 win mark, they won the national championship. I'm not saying, I'm just saying. Huskers' stiffest competition to bring home a title may reside in Madison as Wisconsin also punched their ticket to Tampa for the final four, a 3-1 win over future Big Ten opponent and second seeded Oregon. As you might expect, a joyous scene in the locker room after that one. So the Badgers and the Huskers now head to Tampa, Florida. National semifinals are Thursday. Wisconsin will take on second-seeded Texas after they upset Stanford in the regional finals. Other side of the bracket, it's Nebraska and Pittsburgh. They were the top seed in their region. Both Big Ten teams, were they to win, would have a rematch of the 2021 National Championship. Of course, Wisconsin won the title there in a five-set thriller. Women's hoops, the AP poll is out. The top 10 all remain the same. That includes Iowa at number four, Indiana up a spot to number 15, and Ohio State remains at number 12. More on the Buckeyes as we go on the court with star Cody McMahon. She had one of the best freshman seasons that I've ever seen. She was just so instrumental in our success. She provided such great energy and passion throughout the season. A lot of times you talk about the freshman wall, and she never hit it. She had a strong personality, a strong game, so she fit in just fine. That was good! When I first met Cody, she was the one that I connected with the fastest. Her enthusiasm and her competitiveness, especially someone so young having that drive, that's what stuck out the most. I'm not going to lie, going into the season, I was not confident at all. Once I started getting comfortable, you know, I feel like sky was the limit with my teammates around me. They also motivated me to help them out and just play my game. Great wingspan, but just stretches almost like Superman. I grew up in Centerville, about an hour from Columbus. I live with my grandparents. My mom being a single mother, she was always working and trying to provide for me and my older brother. My grandparents stepped in and helped her out. And we all moved in. So when she was working, her three jobs, we had somebody to obviously watch us. 
She worked so hard for us to live that lifestyle that you know we wanted as a kid and that we saw other kids have. My mom played basketball and had me and my brother in college, so she really couldn't take it as far as she wanted to. So just seeing her in the stands, being so proud of me, basically living her dream, it honestly, it just touches my heart and it motivates me. Obviously my mom inspires me, but my grandma, she really inspires me just because no matter what she goes through, her faith never fails. Oh my God, I'm gonna cry. <laughs> um, yeah, it's just very cool to see that, you know, like no matter what she goes through, she makes every day count. I've watched, you know, the people I love closest to me go through hard things, and I feel like that's why I am the way I am. Go, Kyle, good! Cody brings so much energy and happiness, regardless of what she's going through. Basketball is serious, but it doesn't have to be serious all the time. I love to have fun, I love to laugh, I love to be loud and just keep the energy up. She keeps everybody light, I think, in times where we need it. Let's go! She sings every day in practice because she's just loud. <laughs> so I don't know if she's singing or talking. It's kind of kind of all runs together. He just knows that's how I am. It's nothing that we could really do about it. <laughs> Look at this. We're going up there. We went on a trip to Brazil. It was a basketball trip. We played one game and then got to enjoy the rest. How do you feel? Feel great. One more leg of the trip to Miami and take that overnight flight. McGuff, I like to pick on him a lot just because he kind of stays to himself. I like to get the behind the scenes of how he can really be with our team. Today we are subbing in for McGuff, Carla, and JP. She thinks she can do it just because she's going to go, right, right, right. <laughs> exactly. We spent a lot of days, a lot of time at the beach. This team loves the water. It was a cool, fun family trip that we got to take. See different things as a team. It really helped us gel off the court. She actually has a really good singing voice. She doesn't always use her good singing voice, though, which drives me crazy. I don't want people to really know that I can. She loves to sing. She loves to dance. The band. They know that every time they play Buckeye Swag, like that's my song. So I walk out and all of a sudden I hear it and I'm just, I dance to it. I'm Cody McMahon here in Ohio State Women's Basketball Lounge and I'm here to reveal my slide obsession. I love the Grinch, I'm obsessed with the Grinch. <laughs> I collect little Grinch stuffed animals. This is kind of my favorite. So I had a Grinch Christmas tree back at home and you know, you kind of set the head at the top and the legs kind of at the bottom. So it's like, you know, cute. <laughs> I get the same nail color pretty much all the time. <laughs> it matches my shoes. Watching the Grinch, he has that goofy side, especially seeing when he's in his little cave and he does the little ooh, ah. Honestly, it reminds me of me. One of the core values of our program is passion. And when Cody showed up, every rep, every drill, every scrimmage, every game, every bus ride, every team meeting, got a lot more passion. You can see McMahon and the Buckeyes on Big Ten Plus Friday against Grand Valley States. And then a week from today, a huge one against future conference foe UCLA. That's over on FS1. They return to conference play December the 30th in Ann Arbor. It is admittedly very early, but everyone in the Big Ten with at least one conference game under their belts, with 10 teams having played two. Indiana, the only team to go 2-0. and Illinois, Northwestern, Wisconsin all won their lone game. Three winless teams. You got Rutgers at 0-1 and, and Iowa and Michigan State 0-2. Uh, Andy likes tears, not the kind that come from your eyes, but he, but he likes to, to tear the team. So let's go through your top tiers in the Big Ten. Who's tier one? Uh, it's Purdue, Purdue by itself. Um, the beauty of this year's Big Ten, while others will criticize and whether or not it's deep and all that, 
I think what we're going to see is better seeds for a smaller amount of teams, which ultimately all that may matter is do you have teams that are good seeds that can progress deeper into March? Purdue is in a class by itself. They are the favorite. They should win it by multiple games. As they did a year ago. Who's in the next year? Uh, I think there are two teams that potentially could challenge them, Illinois and Wisconsin. They are made potentially to do that. It's a tall task, but Illinois has the star in Terrence Shannon Jr., who's an all-Big Ten player. Right. They need, obviously, their complimentary players to step up um, and you know contribute uh, uh, on a regular basis. And is that Domask? Is that Coleman Hawkins? Wisconsin, they have a you know quality point guard in Chucky Hepburn. Um, AJ Store has been a phenomenal ad, so is John Blackwell. And Tyler Wall is starting to play much better. So they're in that mix as well. And they've got great wins so far. Yeah, no doubt. Their resume is really good. Who's in the next tier? Ohio State Northwestern. Uh, the Buckeyes, you know, at this point, have the win over Alabama. Um, despite the 18-point loss or blowing that lead to Penn State, again, they've got maybe the best backcourt in the Big Ten with Thornton, Gale, and Battle. And Northwestern, they've beaten Purdue. Boo Booey, all Big Ten player, don't have a great front court, but they've got enough guys on the perimeter to finish in that top five. It is such a head scratcher not to see Michigan State and Maryland in there. And it's not, I mean, I, it'd be indefensible to put them in there right now, but it's pretty remarkable that we're at this point and they're not there. Yeah, I mean, I've thought about who else could move up. Um, and after this weekend, you'd have to say Michigan, Nebraska, Rutgers are the three teams that have potential to move up. I'm not writing off Michigan State or Maryland yet just no, because not, of the I'm caliber. Not I'm not saying you are either. I'm just yeah. saying the, the caliber of, of players they have. But, but it's been a rough start for both of them. We will see you tomorrow. Thanks so much, as always, for watching Big Ten Today.